They, um, I'm not sure where this one was found specifically, but it's very similar to um, our own skull as well. Um, remember that I um, mentioned Cavalli Swarza and the Stanford group of geneticists, and they're the ones that came out with this chart that humans evolved in Africa but down in that uh, western area and then migrated across the Kalahari and up to, let me get the, the pointer, then migrated up to the Rift Valley. The problem we have here is that we don't have deposits that would be of the age and ecology within which humans would be found. It's been erosion and redeposition. This area of Africa, East Africa, and the Rift Valley in particular, is an area where the deposits are there, and that is where we find many of the human hominid and hominin fossils. And then this little circle here is where humans eventually crossed over to the Middle East and then into Asia and into Europe. That has been uh, estimated to have happened about 100,000 years ago. Uh, I think that's being pushed back now. All this changes from the time I give the talk to the next time I give the talk, there's new skeletons found, new bones found, new theories put forward. And uh, so what I say today is going to be wrong tomorrow, and you will be reading about it. So here is a one, uh, one theoretical diagram of the way that humans evolving in Africa then separated out and moved up into the Middle East and moved up into Asia. Now there is an advantage for humans. They were in, uh, we were, we, our ancestors, great-great-grandma, great-great-grandpa, um, were in Africa for millions of years. But once they got out and they got into Asia, their population started to blossom. And the reason is, is that humans evolved together with the tropical African diseases that kept the population down or so the theory goes, one of them being malaria, which is 50 million years old and has affected humans and others, the tsetse fly, which we talked about, and various other parasites. Asia didn't have those parasites because the primates, the early primates, did not, weren't as numerous there, and it wasn't subtropical, and therefore it is postulated that that's why population could grow very rapidly in Asia. As population grew in Asia, people started to migrate uh, westward, and they migrated into Europe, eventually filling up Europe, and that's where you get Neanderthals, and you get uh, Homo erectus, and various other kinds of uh, human species. And that's another point of contention, whether they're the same species, or whether they're different species. So here we have uh, a timeline. These are millions of years along the bottom. This is today, here on the very right. Then you have one million years ago, two million years ago, three million years ago, four, etc. The green uh, squares or the green rectangles are the non-human, non-homo, a different species but uh, very similar to us hominids and maybe even hominims, new, new category of close cousins to humans. 
And the red is the homo. That's the same genus as us, but different species. And where they start, where they end, is, uh, is what's postulated where they went extinct. So you have Homo here, you have Homo habilis, which is the early tool maker. He as, appears here, he disappears here. That doesn't really mean he disappeared. It means we're just not finding any fossils. And you have Homo ergaster, and I'll show you a Homo ergaster very similar to ourselves. In fact, there is an argument that maybe these are all the same genus and the same species as us. And that the reason they look different and they seem like different species is because we only have a few skeletons here and there and the variation is normal between individuals. Well, where do mammals come from? 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs roamed the Earth. Mammals were tiny little organisms that were like the size of mice and rats. And they couldn't compete with the dinosaurs. So they, they were nocturnal and they had huge eyes, which is why you, they, we know that they were nocturnal. This is one of the first postulated uh, mammals. And what happened 65 million years ago? A asteroid hit the Earth and it fell right where Chichen Itza is, right at the top of the Yucatan Peninsula. And if you look at even the, um, the satellite photographs, you can see the crater that was left underwater by that asteroid. When the asteroid fell, it created a ecological disaster and changed the whole ecology of the Earth at the time and the dinosaurs' food supply disappeared because they needed, they depended on plants. When the dinosaurs went extinct, these little guys were now free to roam the Earth and the age of mammals began. And this is the original uh, postulated one of the earliest mammals that was found and these are the mammals that evolved into uh, carnivores, into marsupials, you know marsupials are the pouched animals and they dominated South America. Those of you who have traveled to South America have probably heard of marsupials there that looked very much like the saber-toothed tiger but they were pouched animals. They went extinct eventually. Um, and you have the primates evolving. All of a sudden you have the primates appearing. So here are they. This is the diagram for the appearance of the primates. So they're appearing at 66 million years ago, which is just about the time that the asteroid hits the Earth at the Yucatan Peninsula and creates an environment that is uh, safer for these defenseless animals. And uh, the, it makes space. I mean, you know, dinosaurs did dominate. They were extremely successful. They lived for 250 million years and dominated the earth and dominated the ecological niches. So you had the monkeys and the primates now free to evolve and they branch out at three million years ago, all of a sudden they branch out. And this is what the early primate looks like. The primate has a tail, it has hands and feet that are flexible and prehensile, 
That means it can hold on to branches, and the tail is prehensile. And most of these primates are found in Europe and in Asia. Now, what has to happen to that animal in order for it to evolve into what we see as the higher primates and eventually the humans? Well, look at the changes that had to take place. It's a lot of changes, and this is where the mystery is. We had to become bipedal, upright walking. We're the only animal on the earth that is completely bipedal. Chickens are bipedal, but they have wings. And the reason they're bipedal is because they really used to fly and now they're domesticated not to fly. We had to lose our tail. We still have a few little bones left in the back that suggest that we had tails long ago, but they don't work as tails anymore. We had skeletal changes. Then look also, birthing changed. The way babies are born the pelvis. The baby's born with a big head, 25% of its full grown head at birth. That's got to go through the birth canal. We're the only primate that has that, that uh, challenge. And the baby's born dependent on the mother. Other babies and other animals, especially primates, they're born and they cling to the mother. What do our babies do? Our babies have to be carried around. They still have the cling uh, reflex. If you, put, if you touch the baby's hand, you touch the baby's feet, it'll grasp. And that's left from our ancestors. But the baby can't hold on to us because we have no hair to begin with. That has to happen. Our hands, our arms had to change. The fingers changed. We now have a opposable thumb. We can pick up a pin. We can pick up a piece of thread. We're probably the only animal that can really do that very efficiently. The face changed. And very importantly, the brain changed. There are changes in the brain, and it is not just size, which is what you will read about. They say, well, this that primate had a smaller brain, this had a larger brain. I don't think the size of the brain is that relevant. It is the composition of the brain that's relevant and that's important. And that is very hard to determine from skeletal remains. So look at what happens here. We have primates, non-hominid, prim hominoid primates. And then 25 million years ago, the primates lose their tails. And they lose their tails somewhere between Europe. There are no primates in Africa at this point. And somewhere between Europe, it, there's a band of primates across Europe and Asia, somewhere there between there and their migration into Africa, they lose their tail. And we don't know what's happened. There's a recent article about it from <clears throat> Yale University, and they talk about a jumping gene that just simply went over to another chromosome and lost its connections. And uh, that is what may have happened to these primates. So here's the earliest primate found in Africa, and this is one that doesn't have a tail, obviously. And it has an opposable thumb. Its teeth have changed. Look at the teeth up there. It has this giant canine, the, the eye tooth, as people call it. And all of a sudden, that starts to shrink. That means the diet has changed. It's not a uh, meat eater. 
solely anymore. It's now eating seeds and fruits and it's grinding food rather than simply uh, biting it and tearing it off. And you know that when you eat meat, you don't really need to chew it very well to get it to digest. Meat digests in our body without the chewing, and what, but the carbohydrates, nuts, seeds, and such, we have to chew because the digestion starts in the mouth itself. So that will be reflected in the teeth. That starts to happen around 35 million years ago, we find this uh, primate. Here is the, the same, the brother or cousin of this primate in Europe, just before it loses its tail. So by the time, the, this is the ancestor, so by the time the descendants of this one come to uh, Africa, they have lost their tail. They have changed completely and adapted to a new environment. And it seems that there was probably more woodland in Africa then, back then, 35, 50 million years ago, than there is today. And there is this little strip along the eastern coast of woodland because primates are adapted to trees and they're not adapted so well to savanna. Savanna requires four-legged or two-legged running in the grass. So it is thought that the original primates who migrated down from Europe came into this forest area and that the forest area was probably more extensive across Africa than uh, it is today and was later. The first real tailless ape that is very close to modern apes is the proconsul. It was found in Kenya and it is 23 to 25 to 5 million years ago and it looks it can walk on all fours and yet it is a tree animal so obviously he's living in a forest there's got to be a forest around he's not a totally a savanna creature look at his teeth his teeth are still a meat eating teeth chimpanzees also have a lot of meat eating teeth. As time goes on, the next animal that we have is the Ramapithecus, Pithecus being ape, and this one seems to be walking upright. And recent research has shown that they have found some bones of uh, upright walking apes that are six million years old. Now the question of bipedalism or upright walking is a mystery. Why would an animal walk upright and how did it happen? First of all, it had to have happened pretty quickly. You can't have an animal that is both bipedal and quadrupedal. It has to be either one or the other. It has to have mastered all of the nervous system and the balance and the bones for <coughs> one or the other. And it happens very quickly. It seems to happen within a few hundred thousand years, which is a few generations. This guy, if you look, his arms are very long, which are still arboreal arms. They're for flipping from branch to branch, which means he's still living in a forest. And the feet have a toe that can also grab and hold on. And it's a flexible, flexible foot. So this is the first bipedal hom hominid. 
And then there is this cutie, Artie. Artie is recent, and I think she's kind of sweet. Uh, this, she's found in Ethiopia, and she's 4.4 million years old. And there are about a hundred specimens of different uh, individuals found at several sites in Ethiopia of this totally bipedal uh, primate. And if you look at her, she's still got the long arms that are used for hanging on trees. But look at her foot. She's got a foot that isn't very flexible. And here's the bones of the foot. There's, they're missing a little bone from the toe there. But she's got a foot that is uh, less flexible, but can still grab on to a branch. And yet, from the pelvis and the balance of the hip bones, the femur, we know that she was completely bipedal and comfortable walking on, all, uh, on two feet. So they, she's an anomaly. We don't know exactly how she fits in. But the, most of the finds that have been done, and this is the leakies, uh, have done, had made these finds. They're along the Rift Valley, along uh, from Ethiopia further south. And the most numerous ones are of the Australopithecus which is a little bit younger than Artie is. So they follow Artie, probably. We're not always too sure. Australopithecus is a very interesting, um, interesting sort of animal. And it is the first one that was found was the complete skeleton of Lucy, and she lived 3.2 million years ago. And she was found in 1973 and made a big splash because she was not only bipedal, but she had the thin, uh, balanced bones uh, very similar to human beings. Now again, returning back to the question of the brain, is saying uh, Lucy has a bigger brain than its predecessors or than the other apes. But actually, we don't know very much about the brain. And we don't know what parts of the brain an Australopithecus or an Ardy had develop because these parts of the brain that are uh, word cognition, speech, meaning, perceptions, memories, etc., they don't leave a physical, any physical evidence in the skeleton. And we don't have complete skulls in most cases. Even if we did have the complete skull, it may not tell us everything about the brain. So that we don't know if these guys had speech, uh, but we do know pretty soon that they, around two million years ago, they started to make tools, and that is Homo habilis. Here are the Lucy bones. Lucy has very slender bones, and she made her sensation because of the completeness of the skeleton and because it is upright. And not only is it upright, but it has all the features to, of the pelvis for delivering a child that is not as developed as a chimpanzee child. And she has an articulation. Her shoulders, her hips are articulated in the way of modern man. The one foot that was found in Ethiopia of these uh, Australopithecines is, is the same as Lucy, was that little bone showed 
that the foot was rigid and it was a walking foot. And they, they, this proves that the Australopithecus walked upright and was balanced upright. So how did the transition to uh, bipedalism happen? Why did it happen? And is it a, it, it must have been an advantage, obviously, because bipedalism survived, but we don't know. Uh, we don't know why it happened, we don't know how it happened. This is a traditional model, but it now seems that it was much more rapid, that there wasn't this, these in-between stages, that the uh, primates simply, in a few generations, just stood up and the bones readjusted themselves or um, changed balance. And this was uh, further uh, supported by Mary Leakey's find of these footprints in Laetoli, in uh, Tanzania. These are footprints of a bipedal primate, and they're 3.7 million years ago. Re more recent found finds are now go push back bipedalism back to 6.6 .6 million years ago. And you can see the difference between the foot, uh, the modern foot, and which is very stiff. You can't do much with your toes. You can't pick up a pin with your toes. Whereas the um, foot of the early uh, primates, bipedal primates, has a different transfer of weight. And therefore, you know that they're not completely bipedal, or at least they, uh, ha they can still manage in the forest and in trees and among trees. So here's a, a look at what uh, these Australopithecus pithecines might have looked like. One of the things about humans is dimorphism. It means the human female tends to be smaller than the human male, even though she's carrying a baby. And that is a very important consideration, is that if humans are hunters, how does, how does the female hunt while she's carrying a baby? Then once the baby is born, unlike other primate babies which hang on to their mother, because the mother has hair, they hang on to the mother's hair, humans do not do that. So that really cuts down on her ability to hunt while she's pregnant and while she's got this little baby, plus the fact that the baby is born less developed than most primate babies. So this is the comparison of the chimp, uh, or lamer, actually, the Laetoli footprint in the middle and the modern footprint, and you can see how the foot has evolved in order to be able to uh, be completely bipedal. And here are the footprints that those drawings were made from. And you can see there on the one on the right where the toe is uh, sticking out. That means that it is still able to hold on to branches and probably still walks. Now there is this gate and it is the gate of humans, primates, and living things. Each one has a, it, it's called the biological movement. But you can see the difference between the way the chimp walks and Lucy. Now here's what happens when the chimpanzee is starting to walk, would walk upright, which it can for certain small distances. Now you're going to compare Lucy to the modern 
human and where you see the red is where you've had some changes have to take place. The pelvis changes and the femur has to change. It has to be angled in in order to provide the long-term walking gait that we have. And there you have a comparison of the uh, Lucy and the Australopithecus to early humans. And you can see that they, the pelvis and the femur, the thigh bones in particular, are angled at a different angle than the human uh, bones are angled. In order for us to be able to be completely bipedal, our thigh bones, our femur has to be angled inward toward the knee. So if they find the knee bones in an excavation, they can pretty well tell how that organism used to walk. You don't have to find the upper part of the femur, you need to find the lower part of the femur in order to be able to determine it. There's also other changes, and that is that the skull has to balance differently. The skull in humans is balanced in the middle, and the skull in early primates is balanced on the, on the back, which means that the head is forward and that has to ch had changed. And you've got the different types of dentition. Teeth had to change. Look at the chimp's teeth, they're the protruding jaw, and that is because it also eats and hunts with its mouth and its teeth. Australopithecus in the middle with her teeth, and then you have the human, and we lose some teeth in the process. We have fewer teeth, but our teeth have a, um, a more, they are made for a more varied diet, and for seeds and nuts and for grinding, not so much for meat and for hunting. These guys in the middle, the Australopithecus, you can see she could eat seeds and various plants, but the protruding teeth and, and the shape of the jaw indicates that it also could be used for hunting small animals. Now what happens a change in also the way the birth and the baby comes in humans? And that is, the baby is born with a fat layer. It is unlike, in this way, unlike from, uh, unlike the primate babies, it swims naturally. It has reflexes, like the grabbing reflex, they go away. Its brain is 25% of what it's going to be, so it only grows 75% which makes it more dangerous. The brain is bigger and it has to come through the pelvis. And when it comes, there's the human, when it comes through the pelvis, it is more dangerous for the mother than it is for the chimp or for the Australopithecus, which just drops the baby um, with no problems. Our brain cells change, and this is something that's very difficult to uh, evaluate. We have coordination. The baby is very slow to develop coordination compared to other primates, and it is born virtually hairless. And the mother is now hairless, so the baby can't hold on to the mother's hair. The mother has to carry the baby. And the period of time that the baby is dependent is a lot longer than the chimp baby or than other animal babies, which means that 
the mother is now dependent upon other members of the social group that means they have to live in social groups and she's dependent on males for hunting and for uh, providing part, certain types of the uh, food. The grasp reflex, it, we're born with it, it lasts about nine months, it's in our hands and feet and then it disappears, but it's not really a viable grasp reflex because we can't hold on with it. Australopithecines, there were eight species of Australopithecines. In the past, they were all drawn and, and recreated in this kind of way, but they probably looked a lot more human than, um, than what, we think, what we used to think of. By two million years ago, to uh, many of the early primates disappear and are replaced now by the Australopithecines, which seem to take over all of that eastern part of Africa. And they form social groups. The social groups are defended by certain males, and they have hierarchies. If they follow what we know about primates and primate behavior, they probably have a higher male hierarchy, and because the females cannot hunt while they're pregnant and while they're carrying the babies, the males then have to take over certain, rule, certain roles for the group. This means that the groups live in social entities. They are now society. They are now dependent, interdependent, one on the other. Australopithecines were divided into eight different species. Uh, whether that is accurate or not, I, I, don't, I, I don't buy it. Uh, I think Australopithecines are pretty much one species. But here is what the Australopithecus robustus, it's called robustus because it has a very thick bone and it has teeth. These kinds of, these molars that are meant for grinding very heavy things and it is considered that possibly they are also grinding bones of various kinds. Now the, the original work was started by Louis Leakey and continued by his children and his wife. His wife worked with him. And in one place in the Old Dubai Gorge, he, uh, Richard Leakey, his son, found three different species of hominids together in the same place, which indicates that they were all contemporaneous and possibly interacted. What did the Australopithecus eat? The Australopithecus was a scavenger, and they lived in the savanna. And what is there to eat in the savanna? There was nuts, berries, <coughs> foods like that, small animals, and they were hunters and gatherers, much like the sun that we talked about earlier, the hunters and gatherers of today. They, um, they lived in these social groups, and they were not big game hunters. Here are all the places where we found Australopithecus in uh, Africa, and that is not totally controlled by where, that, that doesn't mean this is the only place they lived. This is where we find the deposits that they would have lived in. In many other places, the deposits are gone. They have either eroded or they have been covered over or other kinds of geologic activity has wiped out the remains. It is very possible that uh, we'll find Australopithecus and we'll find human ancestors, Homo, in other areas as well. But right now, 
The ridge finds are along that rift valley, which is where that continent is breaking off, and the conditions there are right for finding these, um, these remains. Now, one of the things that happens in the evolution of humans is that the, it's called neoteny. We become more childlike in our appearance. The, and you can see this very clearly in the uh, skulls. The skulls become, this one on the bottom is a child. The tongue child, an Australopithecus found in 1942, a young individual. So our skulls have, even in adults, have become, have retained certain childlike characteristics. For instance, we don't have huge brow ridges. We don't have that ridge on the very top that uh, connects the muscles for the jaw in order to be able to uh, crush uh, bones and crush various kinds of heavy foods, we become more childlike. And this is the child's skull and of two and a half million years ago, an Australopithecus, and he was found, he's perfectly bipedal, and he's found in a forest environment. And he actually was found before some of the later ones, and before Artie, and before some of the, the ones that I showed you. So that was the prototype when people said, Ar Australopithecus looks like this. It used to be taken from that child. Another uh, young person that was found is Lake Turkana. And if you'll notice the Rift Valley here, the Rift Valley was actually uh, crossed by a river uh, six mi up to six million years ago. And that river has stopped flowing and has formed now a series of lakes. He is a, a boy, a hominid boy, um, that was probably two and a half million to 1.6 million years ago. And this is what the reconstruction looks like. He looks very modern in many ways. They've given him a mouth and a lip that isn't really uh, very modern looking, but he was probably very modern. And this is what his skeleton, it's one of the uh, most complete skeletons that have been found of this human. He is homo, he's the same genus as we are, but they've given him a different species, although I have a feeling that he's probably the same species we are. The very complete skeleton shows that he was completely bipedal, and he did everything that we can do. About two million years ago, uh, we start to find tools. Humans start to find, to make flint tools, and that's where we get Homo habilis occasionally found with the tools. Sometimes we find the tools without any bones, and sometimes we find them with the bones, which shows the association. And this is the skeleton, the, the skull, found with some of the tools. But humans have been considered man the hunter. Well, it, it, man the hunter was never man the hunter. He was man the hunted. And uh, even though he had a, a bigger brain, he was food for predators. And the tools and the brain that he had gave him and her the ability to survive. And what did Homo habilis prove? The early bones of, human, of Homo habilis showed that this was a clever individual. This was a smart and creative uh, organism, a, a, a human organism. He had a, a power grip, 
prehensile thumb that could hold uh, sticks and use them for tools, and he had a precision grip. And this is the tools that he made. These are flint tools. And flint has a certain way of breaking. And these flint tools have been found with footprints of humans. So we know that the people who were making these tools were bipedal and were very similar to humans. The flint has a certain characteristic, and it's called conchoidal fracture. It fractures like glass in circles. And this human, Homo habilis, learned to make flint flakes and hand axes. There's a flake off of a hand axe on the top, where they found, actually, the two pieces as they were being worked, and they were probably left as that. So all these stories about man the hunter that we used to get in high school are probably not true. Man was never a hunter. Man was smarter than that. To go after a mastodon or a mammoth is not particularly smart, and it's not a good way to survive. Because first of all, how long can you eat that meat before it spoils? You've got a group of 50, 50 individuals, your family group, and uh, you've got this huge animal. That's probably not what they were doing. They were making these tools, and with these tools, they were hunting small animals, and they were scavenging, probably. This shows you the hand axe. The hand axe was very handy for um, cutting up meat and cutting up animals and cutting up and actually digging for animals. This comes from an illustration from Livingston, uh, Livingston's book, and it shows people hunting today. And of course, this is no way for these people to survive. So man the hunter was probably man the hunted, and he had to defend himself. But what he was doing was probably following the herds of animals when they were moving. These herds moved through East Africa and Northeast Africa, and they leave behind the weaker animals. And humans probably followed these herds and used the tools to uh, collect up the animals that were fallen behind and they could then smash the bones and eat the bones. And there are actually pictures of modern day uh, children doing that in, in various places. And we found marrow bones that were marked where they had been chopped and where they had been broken and used by human beings. So humans were probably scavengers. They probably were not hunting huge animals. They lived in social groups where they would follow these herds, and they had a social system that was probably a hierarchy and with protecting, with certain individuals protecting the group and other individuals doing other kinds of specialized trade, and eventually they had fire. We don't know when fire started, but we think it's about 200,000 years ago, so not a long time ago. These are the uh, main sites along East Africa that various human-like human ancestor and Australopithecus were found. 
Fire, evidence of fire first comes from Asia, actually, although uh, it's very difficult to tell whether fires are natural or fires were started by humans. But at some point, probably around 200,000 years ago, humans have fires and they use those fires to control their environment, to burn the grasses, and to favor the grasses that they uh, will eat from. And then around 100,000 uh, years ago, uh, Homo sapiens, they moved out of Africa. Earlier genus, uh, earlier genus of humans moved earlier out of Africa into Asia. But Homo sapiens moved out about 100,000 years ago and moved into the Middle East and all the way down to Australia. The Australians have been dated to 70,000 years ago and then spread over the world. And the, one of the reasons that is postulated they could have spread was, again, because the parasites that they evolved, that we evolved with, were African parasites. They were there before us. And when they got out, that's uh, when they were free of those parasites and the population could grow. This is a fantasy picture that, that is not real. Neither animal nor human is real there, but I thought it was kind of a fun picture. Thank you very much.